I'm Elizabeth Castelli. I'm Interim Director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women here at Barnard. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, our first on-campus event of the semester, one of two critical Caribbean feminisms programs on our calendar in the coming months. I want to acknowledge the work of numerous people in pulling this evening's program together. First and foremost, Tammy Navarro, Associate Director of BCRW, who's worked with others to create the Critical Caribbean Feminism series. I want to thank uh, Pam Phillips, Avi Cummings, Hope Dechter, and Che Gossett for their help with this program, as well as our student research assistants who are here tonight, Asha Fetterman and Sophie Kreitzberg. In addition, I want to add a word of appreciation uh, to the caterers and facilities workers whose labor makes tonight's event possible. And finally, I want to let you know that Word Up Community Bookshop is in the house um, and is represented by Taylor, who's sitting over here by the red tablecloth, um, who has copies of books by our featured guests um, for you to purchase, and they have agreed to um, sign them for you after the event. So I'm now going to turn the mic over to Tammy, who's going to introduce our guests, and I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, good evening, and thank you all for joining us for this exciting rescheduled event. Um, as Elizabeth said, this, this conversation is part of a larger series of events centering the Caribbean that we at BCRW, along with our colleagues at the various small acts platforms, and I know David Scott is here somewhere, um, so thank you. Uh, so we've, we've partnered together in order to organize these events under the new banner of Critical Caribbean Feminisms. So we began this iteration of that intervention last academic year after the wonderful success of our Caribbean Feminisms on the Page series, and I hope some of you have joined us for those um, wonderful conversations. Nicole was saying she was at the very first one back in 2014 with Jamaica Kincaid, so we've come a long way. So over the years, we've been fortunate to welcome a number of important writers under this banner, including Jamaica Kincaid, Edwige Danticat, and more recently, Claudia Rankin. The changes we've made to our offerings will allow us to broaden our focus and offer even more critical engagements with the region. So while there have been some changes to this series, one thing has remained constant, the intellectual partnership of our stalwart moderator, Kayama Glover. From the very beginning, Kayama has been a force. So some of you will remember that tonight's event was originally scheduled for last March, and we were snowed out. What you may not know is that Kayama traveled to New York through that snowstorm to moderate the event. Here tonight, she has traveled to be with us once again, this time from her current fellowship in Paris, to shape this conversation, and I would like to thank her for her many ongoing contributions. So now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for tonight's event. Kayama L. Glover is Associate Professor of French and Africana Studies at Barnard College. She is the author of Haiti Unbound, A Spiralist Challenge to the Postcolonial Canon, co-editor of Translating the Caribbean, a volume of critical essays on translation in the Americas, and of the forthcoming Duke Haiti Reader. Glover has published articles in the French Review, Research in African Literatures, the Journal of Haitian Literature, Small Acts, French Forum, and Public Culture, among others. She's the founding co-editor of Essex Archipelagos, a Small Acts platform for digital practice, and director of the Digital Humanities Project in the same boats toward an Afro-Atlantic intellectual cartography. She's currently a fellow at the Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Reed Hall in Paris. Erna Broadbur was born in 1940 to an elementary, these are details she provided to us to be shared publicly, <laughs> was born in 1940 to an elementary school teacher and a small farmer. She attended the village elementary school before leaving in 1952 for Excelsior High School in Kingston, where she completed the usual examinations and found employment in the civil service as a clerk and later a teacher before moving on to university in 1960 to read for a degree in honors history. She chose history because, quote, I thought it would best fit me for work among my people, the descendants of Africans enslaved in the new world, end quote. 
Broadbury is the author of a number of works of both fiction and nonfiction, including the novels Jane and Louisa Will Soon Come Home, Louisiana, The Rainmaker's Mistake, and the collection The World is a High Hill. Her seven nonfiction monographs are in history and sociology and all deal with the black experience. She is currently preparing a volume of essays on the relationship between African Americans and African Jamaicans from 1782 to 1996, but apparently that's out of date because that's since been complete. So we're on to the new project. <laughs> so the eighth monograph. Nicole Dennis Ben is the author of Here Comes the Sun, a New York Times notable book of the year, which was named to Amazon.com's best book of 2016 and Kirkus Review's best debut fiction of 2016. Dennis Ben is a Lambda Literary Award winner and a finalist for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and the 2017 Young Lions Fiction Award. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Elle, Electric Literature, Ebony, and The Feminist Wire. So please join me. We're gonna ask the, the authors to each read as we often, as we always do, to each read for 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll engage in a moderated conversation. So please join me in welcoming Erna Broadburn. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to read from Maya, which is my second novel published in 1988 and which um, won the Commonwealth Prize for Canada and the Caribbean in, in 1988, same year. I'm sharing in this reading a portrait of my favorite female character. And I begin. Things started from early. Who except past none such business with dates? But Miss Getter did have her numbers right. It was the 27th, Sunday the 27th of January, in fact. And that was when silent Miss Gatta started to talk. Anyone who had never seen Miss Gatta Paisley in the spirit before would think it was a coconut tree in a private hurricane that was coming down the road. Or somebody else might say, is Burnham would come down to Dunsinane. <laughs> Miss Gatta looking like she had a warning. The long green dress with the tiny red flowers, the head tie of the same print, tied rabbit ear fashion, the big wooden circles in her ears, and the bunch of oleander gripped tight in her hands like they were one and the same. And the swinging and the swaying and the twirling. Miss Gatta now have no ordinary foot, walking tum 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 and mashing the stones down into the mud. Toes only, and the legs and the thighs are oars. With her body braced back 45 degrees from the ground was how Miss Gatta walked that morning through Grovetown. Her ten little black toes escaping from the long red and green dress scratched the gravel of the road like a common foe looking for worms. That was the delicate side of her motion. And then there was the large, still with the back at an angle of 45 degrees on the ground, she took long steps beginning with and ending with her heel. It was early on the, and the road was empty because it was Sunday morning. No one was about fetching wood or water or going to the field. This was a quiet time, getting in the mood for the Sunday service. Miss Getta had no audience, but Miss Getta spoke, and that was how her private hurricane became a private public event. Um, I don't know why this thing is going on the page, but anyhow, we'll put up with that. The spirit led her to the Baptist bands. Seems the warning was for the Reverend Simpson. So Miss Getta spoke, nine times three is 27, three times three times three. She recited, she sang, she intoned in one register, in another, and in one octave and another, then higher and higher, lyrically with syncopation, with improvisations far, far out from our original composition. The changes were musical only. The lyrics never changed. Nine times three is 27, three times three times three. And then the wheeling, the turning, the bending, the scratching, and the moving on the heel. Reverend Simpson did not even look outside the window at Miss Gatta, and the whole concert was a public event by now. It was with the ears and the head that people saw it. They shooed the children back inside and closed the wooden windows facing the road. Miss Gatta dancing, Miss Gatta talking, Miss Gatta warning. Man would feel, and that would be hard enough. Why watch too? Reverend Simpson continued to dress for church. He had to. He was going, but was going to be a dear Roger day for him. 
Their Roger, the scripture moveth me and you in sundry places. Not a single soul, except perhaps Mars Levi, and he raised his eyebrows to that, would be in church today. It was Miss Gatta's day. Bless her soul, he said to himself, and again to himself, there are so many different paths. The spirit moved to in sundry places, or perhaps Miss Gatta had called them. For by the time she started her dance back home, visitors had arrived from near and far and occupied her tabernacle. There were men and women, all in dresses, white and red were the colors. Some wore a white dress with a red head tie, some a red dress with a white head tie, some a white dress with a white head tie, and others a red dress with a red head tie. The dress styles varied little, but the nature of the head tie, not at all, all with rabbit ears, all with pencils in the head tie on the right hand side, all yellow and newly sharpened. Then came the drums, their boom bati boom bati boom bati boom, the next item of the program of music and recitation that the Sunday morning offered to Grosstown people, now captive in their little homes. And when the cutting and the clearing was done, and the spirits had recognized each other, and Miss Gatta had been let into her tabernacle, singing a hundred times louder than Miss Gatta's had been, began and the groaning and the dancing and so many feet tramping on the listener's mind. Miss Getter's solo had begun about eight o'clock in the, in the morning. It had caught Mars Levi in the latrine. He never left it. Nine times three is 27, three times three times three. If she didn't change her style so much, if she would only keep one tune, he could follow her and hold her. But that woman was slippery and trying to catch her was taking away from his concentration, and he needed all his energy, and particularly today, since it was Sunday, and it was the 27, three times, three times, three indeed. Dealing with her drained him. Now the boom bati boom bati boom bati boom was deafening him. He had to let go of the doll so he could use his, both his hands to push the sound from his ears. On came the groaning and the stomping, like a hundred men stepping on his chest to cut off his breath and to force him into an asthmatic attack. He pulled his feet up to his chest to protect himself, a baby in the fetal position, his pants halfway down, his BVD grinning, his bottom in the circle of the latrine seat, his privates hanging down like a wet rat, and his doll and his books scattered on the floor of the latrine. This was Mars Levi, who some time ago had tied a thief to a tree and said, root. He had not given up though, he was boxing and kicking off those sounds and those feet, chomping his feet, with much determination, if with little success. I'm having difficulty because the light is falling on this. So we'll stop there. Okay. Can I get her to read some more from sitting here where the light's a bit better? So that is Mass Levi. The tabernacle didn't break for Sunday dinner. The drumming, the singing, and the groaning continued straight through to nightfall. Anita had spent all her 15 years in Grove Town, but she had never before sat in Adam Gatta's performance, though she had heard things. The Honeys were strangers in the district. They had never seen Miss Gatta operate, but they too had heard things. In any case, they had grown up and lived in areas similar to Grove Town, so they knew that three times three times three, and the singing and the drumming and the groaning that held the village frozen in this grip had meaning. They too closed their doors and windows. Could it be that with the windows closed in the day, they were always closed at night, Anita was, lo was losing, was being oxygen starved? Five and eight o'clock had, had not come in thy house without the usual occurrences, but thanks to continued prayer, it had been less and less and less dreadful. Miss Gatta's solo had found that house in prayer, and they had given thanks that the thing that usually pulled and pushed the two women was barely felt that morning. Why with things going so well should Anita now be putting her hands up to her ears, complaining that the noise from the tabernacle was suffocating her? True, the whole situation was packed with awe and dread, but it was so for everyone in the house, and this time, and nobody was taking it as hard as Anita, a child who had gone through so much and conquered. And it must have been bad indeed for her, for teacher Hodes just managed to catch her fainting form. Fainting was one thing, they could fan her and rub her up with smelling salts, and they did. But what to do when the child's face changed to that of an old woman, and she began in her stupor to moan and groan like Miss Gatta and her companions? Where Miss Gatta herself had fallen on the ground, where they had pinned her dress between her legs, 
where she was thrashing, boxing and kicking, and screaming what sounded like, let me go, let me go, where her face changed to that of a beautiful 15-year-old, and back again, and back again, and back again, until she was silent. Her limbs quiet, and she was 15 years old. In the tabernacle, there was consternation at these changes. There, there was indeed joy. Amen, thank the Lord. Telephone from earth to heaven, telephone. There, water mother, full in, in white, lifted a whistle to her belt, from her belt, and with a cord still joined to her waistband, moved to her lips and blew one long, sharp report. All jumping, singing, drumming, and groaning ceased, and everyone, including water mother herself, froze. She blew again and softly, it is finished. And with that, all took what they had and left Miss Getter's form with his 15-year-old face on the ground. Shall we stop? Hello, good evening. I could actually listen to Erna read all night long. All right, so I'm, 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 I actually want to read a small excerpt um, from my novel, Here Comes the Sun. Um, it, here I want to introduce two characters, for those of you who, have not, um, you know, who are not familiar with the book. Um, the first one is Tandy and then her mother, Dolores. So without further ado, I'm just going to um, start with Tandy. I used to be black like you, but look at me. Miss Ruby turns her head from side to side for Tandy to see her salmon-colored skin, delicate with the texture of scalded milk. See how bright my skin come? If you follow instructions, yours will get this way quicker. Know that you have the queen of pearl, you might be lucky. If you want faster results, use it twice a day. She rubs a concoction up and down Tandy's neck, back, arms, and shoulders. She rubs everywhere but her butt crack. Miss Ruby is hardly tender. Tandy wonders if Miss Ruby's roughness is punishment for not having followed her earlier instructions. She imagines her blackness peeling off. The hydrogen peroxide Miss Ruby pours into the mixture, acting, acting like an abrasive, a medicine for her melancholy. She closes her eyes as the warm formula touches her skin. Miss Ruby rubs her way to Tandy's chest. The circular motion of a stranger's hands on her breast makes Tandy blush. She has never been touched this way. She opens her eyes and searches for something anything that can take her mind off the sensation of this strange woman's fingers. She imagines herself as a fish Miss Ruby rubs down with salt and vinegar before frying. Her eyes find the ceiling. Had she been able to lift her arm, she would trace the things she sees projected from her mind. Luckily, you have good hair already, Miss Ruby says. Good coolie hair. Your daddy's an Indian? She asks. I don't know, Tandy says still staring up at the planks in the ceiling. Never met him. Well, God played a cruel joke on you. Because child, if your skin was as pretty as your hair, you'd be one gorgeous woman. Miss Ruby isn't saying anything Tandy hasn't heard before. Her mother says the same thing, often shaking her head the way she does over burned food that has gone to waste. It's a pity you never have skin like your daddy. Tandy's neither the nutmeg brown, nutmeg brown that makes Margot, her older sister, an honorable mistress, a wrong lower than a bright-skinned wife, nor is she black like her mother Dolores, whose skin makes people sympath sympathetic when they see her. Who wants to be black like that in this place? Miss Ruby once said to Tandy about her mother. Miss Ruby gives Tandy the homemade mixture in the jar for her to apply as needed. Only as needed, she stresses. These are very strong chemicals that could kill you. She then reaches for the saran wrap and begins to wrap Tandy's arms and torso. A mummified Tandy sits and listens to Miss Ruby's instructions. If you want to come quicker, leave on the plastic. Don't wash, don't go in the sun. If you have to go in the sun for whatever reason, make sure they cover up at all times from head to toe. If you start to feel like you're going faint, just drink water. It makes you sweat more. But whatever you do, to take off the plastic and remember, stay out to that sun. Miss Ruby repeats these words like an ominous warning, her eyes pouring into Tandy's. Tandy listens and nods, though she wants to rip, rip the saran wrap off and jump into the river. She imagines her skin boiling, becoming molten liquid underneath the plastic wrap. Do I have to wear this all the time? Tandy asks. Heat and sweat is your advantage, just bear it, Miss Ruby says. 
stamping her with a look. Tandy regrets saying anything, sensing her complaint might be interpreted as her wanting less out of life, less opportunity, less chance of attracting the type of boys her mother and sister want her to attract. The type will be at the party for sure. Less chance of acceptance in school, less chance to flunk school, the only ship on which black girls like her could float, given that their looks will never do it for them. Her mother tells her this too. The only thing you have going for you is your education. No ruin it. Meanwhile, the unintelligent Brownings in school end up with modeling contracts or with boyfriends with money they can spend on them. The less attractive ones get good jobs in their family businesses. What else does Tandy have to fall back on if she fails the exam besides her drawings? But no one wants those. No one respects an artist. So when Tandy puts her clothes on, she pretends to ignore the crinkling of the plastic under her uniform and the nausea that comes over her. Miss Ruby examines her skin, her eyes like a sharp razor raking over Tandy's body, as though looking for areas she might have missed, dark patches that need to be rubbed, scrubbed down with the rig of someone scouring the bottom of a burnt pot. Or the way she used to scale fish, her dark eyes having them a subtle hostility that reminds Tandy of the way the girls and nuns at school look at her. Can she tell Tandy doesn't belong? Can she sniff her deceit? Perhaps in that moment, Tandy reminds her of someone who did her wrong, or of herself, the way she looked before she bleached her skin. How suddenly her mood changes once Tandy pays her the money. Remember to stay out of that sun like I tell you, Miss Ruby says, cause you and I both know God not like ugly. All right, and then now Dolores. And this is just a, a very short monologue, um, just to give you a very, um, just to give you some context here about Tandy, and we'll have a discussion about that too. Okay. Dolores comes close to Tandy, her arms open as if to embrace her. Tandy is prepared to rest her head against her mother's big breasts. She's ready to drop her shoulders and let her mother rub them, tell her that it will be all right that Clover got what he deserved. The embrace is a sweet one, one Tandy had forgotten until now. Her mother's love is as vicious and domineering as her personality. Once it's felt, there's none other like it. Tandy relaxes in Dolores' embrace, allowing herself to be rocked back and forth like a baby. But then it's cut short. Slowly, Dolores pries Tandy off her and holds her at arm's length. I want you to come to your senses and turn that boy in. Everything I'm for a reason, and that was it, the Lord says. Do it for all with Tandy. He was defending me, Tandy says. The devil is a liar. Him kick you down, but it don't mean you can't get back up and use the tool him fling give you. What Clover did is history, something long gone. So put it behind you and do the right thing. Him is a brute mama, shh. You go and pay for cursing the dead. The Lord pulls Tandy closer again and rocks her in her bosom. She smells like the green banana she sliced up. She runs her fingers through Tandy's hair as she speaks. You and that boy Charles shouldn't mix in the first place. As I say, if you go pick up with a street boy, then you must at least get something out of it. Forget about what Clover did. That won't set you free. It's enough woman it happened to, and it didn't kill them. What will set you free? is money. Don't say me never teach you that. I send you to good schools for good reasons, yes? But it's also for you to learn common sense. You think because Charles him love you, that you worth something? You think because him say him want you, that he mean it? That is not wanting him after and when him get it him run? What is this love, eh? You don't know nothing about no love. Love is foolish. You ever see love put running water in a pipe? You ever see love build a roof over your head? You ever see love give free education to those children whose parents can't afford it? You ever see love full up with cupboard? You ever see love hand with visa to get out of this rat hole? What can love do for you? How you gonna love a stranger when you don't even know what love is? He will just take advantage of you and walk away. You have to get your returns in dollars, not cents. And besides, who gonna want a naive girl like you? But suppose him did really want you. Could you re really love somebody who is an absolute fool when it come on to these things? Somebody who green? You wouldn't want that, and neither would he. 
You're giving him everything for free. Boys like stupid girls like that. They take one look at your black face and know you're desperate enough to spread your legs at the first compliment. They see your true color before you tell them your name. They know they can tell you anything and your black self believe it and accept it. How we so used to getting the leftovers? Who you know really love a black girl for more than what's between our legs? You's a pretty black girl, but it's my duty as your mother to teach you these things. Put something in your head, child. You know how much money you could have get? 10,000 US dollars. That can take you from here to eternity. Pay for your education and everything. Use your head, child. You can't place more value on this boy and his foolish love over money. If it means a little to you, then you lose everything. Remember this, nobody love a black girl, not even ourselves. Now get up and get your pay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying how, well thank you first of all, Tammy and Elizabeth for the introduction and for believing in this series and continuing it in this way and inviting these two amazing writers to our stage. And thank you both for letting me be here with you. I am a fangirl, I've been reading you for decades and I've discovered you over the last year and as we talked, I think I've read everything you've written at this point. So, um, so thank you both. So the way this works is I get to ask them a few questions and then you should feel free to answer both, um, all of them or hopefully not none of them because that would be <laughs> very awkward. Um, but you could also just one or the other answer them and then uh, Tammy will gesticulate and say I have had enough time and then I'll open it up for you all to engage with, uh, with the two of them. Uh, so the first question I wanna ask you both is, um, is one of, of genre or maybe perspective. I was struck by the fact that you're both fiction writers, but you're also scientists, you by training certainly, and you by training and by practice. And so reading your work, you know, I have this in mind and I'm hoping that you can talk to all of us about the way you stage perhaps the encounter between what we could call like university science, but then the wisdom and the methodologies that you find among the people and the places that you write about. Um, so if there's anything in there you can speak to. All right, so I, um, whew, that's a good question, first of all. All right, so I, um, while I was studying public health, you know, the goal was actually to either go to medical school or, um, of course, get my MPH. And when I did get my MPH, I realized that I was really into women's reproductive health um, and also mental health as well. But, you know, I was working at Columbia um, Mailman School of Public Health, and I felt like, you know, there were articles, um, you know, uh, in terms of sexual health, reproductive health, but I felt like it wasn't the way I wanted to present data or I wanted to, um, to give information to the world, because it was only going to be read by a small amount of people, of course, academics. And, you know, I was still, uh, in addition to that, I wasn't really happy going out in the field and just, you know, recording stories and having nowhere else to really tell these stories where individuals can actually access them. And so that's where writing came in handy for me. I felt like um, fiction really helped me to incorporate some of what I've learned, um, you know, and experienced and put them in, um, like, um, actually express them in a less didactic way. You know, I wanted people to come to my stories feeling that they can engage with the characters. They can feel, they could be immersed in the world. They don't have to be from Jamaica, you know, um, to feel like they're part of this world that really I'm writing the human experience, you know, love, loss, identity, classism, racism, sexuality. I felt like I have more freedom here as a fiction writer to explore those things and still engage an audience, still engage um, myself, really, you know, because I write for myself first. Um, and really feel like I'm doing something worthwhile you know, information is being given, but it's not, um, it's not really beating the reader over the head with, you know, what's with the state of working class Jamaican women in the country. You know, so that was really helpful for me. Thank you. Well, I can say ditto to what she has said there, and probably just shut up after that. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I want to say, particularly about Maya, is that um, I have been in history and in sociology. 
and I found both of them very limiting for what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do in this case was to talk about um, the effects of colonialism. And that is what this, all of this is about. I settled on one particular aspect of it. I call it um, spirit thieving. That what has happened to most of us colonial people or enslaved people, certainly the Africans of the diaspora that I know of, is that we have been separated from our culture and we have been left empty, empty. And what we have has been stolen. Our mind has been stolen. And we have been left empty. And we have to start building. So I wanted to make the point of the emptiness as well as the stealing. So throughout the book here, this is not Mass, Mass Levi is, has stolen the mind of a young girl. She's the brightest girl in the village. And he, has, he is in need at the stage of his life of spirit. So what he has done is to steal her spirit. And Miss Gatha has to come now and give her back her spirit. So I'm dealing with the stealing of the spirit as well as the giving back of the spirit. So throughout, as in this work and as in my notion of the colonial experience as being a set of thiefing, that they have thief our spirit from us and left us as some, some dumb half-wits who just have to follow what they say and follow what they do. But I am not leaving it at that because I feel that there is hope. There are people who are willing, as in Obia or as in Mayal, to give back the spirit. And there are these people who I feel or I felt at the time I was writing and had a problem that we should be encouraging these people who are the givers back of the spirit. As you see, Miss Gatta there is giving back the spirit. And there are four of them, four of them. One of them is a Baptist person. One of them is uh, um, up in the hills. He is a, well, he's a good look man. He's a four eye man. Uh, these terms it might make sense to you, but he can divine, um, he, he, he can tell you what's wrong with you and he can fix it. And one of them is a medicine man, which is different from the four eye man, a medicine man who knows the herbs. He lives in the, in, 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 in the forest. He knows the herbs. So you can come to him and you can be healed in this way. So what I'm dealing here with is the theft of the spirit as well as the healing, which has it, as I saw it then, the healing has to come from our understanding of our religious um, experiences. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things that I want to pick up on what, what you've both said. Um, maybe to start with you, so you, you might want to pick that mic back up. Because the, um, so yes, in both of your works, there's the question of what the world outside the island has done, the theft that has happened, the thing that, may, that I thought about in, in, in both of your, your corpuses is about like the, the parasitism, right? Like the, the way in which um, Europeans or North Americans come and, and, and take to be revitalized, um, but leave, as you say, emptiness behind or humiliation mm -hmm. behind. But what you both do also, which I find quite extraordinary, is you don't leave it there and just blame outside. But there's a very deep look inside, right, to the ways in which people create victims of themselves and victims of other members of their same communities. And, I, and I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about the ways you both confront um, outside of the colonial person, how the colonial mentality has infected and created parasites within Jamaican community or Caribbean community more broadly. Well, the book that followed Maya is The Rainmaker's Mistake. And that was about this thing. It was about how complicit we are in the theft. Complicit we are. We, the descendants of Africans enslaved in the New World, some of us have helped the people to come in and steal from us. In, in, in a section of, of my, which I didn't read there, we talk about them, them having been facilitated 
by the voices inside. Okay. But I developed this much more in The Rainmaker's Mistake, where the rainmaker, nice chap, learning all, I mean, he had all these powers, he knew how to make rain. Well, he made the rain, but the rain he made just came and produced, wash away all the topsoil and made droughts come and the plants can't, can't operate because he didn't learn enough, he didn't, wasn't patient enough to learn how to, how to bring rain and how to stop it at the right time, okay? And I, I, in that work as well, you see um, people who have told themselves that they are the children of the, ensla of the enslaver, which is, okay, which is truth. Many people have said to themselves, enslaved people as well, slaves have said, this is our, my daddy. He's my daddy. And so you can't touch daddy. As people say, daddy's sick, i sick too. Until you could get rid of that, then we are part of our enslavement. So I developed that. I take your point and I develop that much more in the one that follows this. Okay. Yeah, and, um, so similarly with um, Here Comes the Sun, I, you know, it was actually Tiffany Unique who sat up here um, and you know, I later saw something else um, that she did where she asked, what are you writing against? And for me, it's really writing against um, colonialism. You know, it's really, you know, what the monologue I just read with Dolores, um, I always tell um, individuals that Dolores is really the voice of our post-colonial scars. You know, she's that mother who is really passing on what she has internalized as a black working class Jamaican woman um, to her daughter Tandy, you know, saying nobody loves a black girl, not even herself. Right, and Dolores, you know, she's really mothering how she was mothered, and really that was a message being echoed in, in society. Um, and really, it's really self-hate. But for her, in terms of how she mothers, um, really saying to herself that, you know, nobody's gonna give you a pedestal as a black woman in society, so let me be the first one to tell you that, that uh, that's really out of love, you know, giving the tough love, you know, just um, preparing her, her black daughters for that. Um, and you know, there's a character, Margot, who I'd never read here, but, Margot also internalized that as well. You know, Margot works as a um, hotel clerk um, in, the, in the, this, the fancy resort, Palm Star Resort. And um, while she's working hard to send Tandy to school, she prostitutes herself at night um, to the white tourists who come in to the island. And really, um, for her, you know, seeing that upward mobility for the working class Jamaicans is really tough. So many of them have to survive. And so in Margot's case, surviving via prostitution. Um, and, you know, I'm writing these stories, but I, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, you know, wow, you know, of course, I don't think about the outsider while I'm writing, because, you know, you mentioned internal, right, internal um, critique. And for me, it's really, you know, writing this whole concept, well, think about this whole concept of how Jamaica is sold to the world as a paradise. But yesterday, you open the book, and the first thing you see is a young black girl bleaching her skin to be lighter skin, like the ruling class on our, in our island, right? Um, speaking to classism, complexionism, where this little girl, Tandy, feels that she's not valid, she's not worthy if she's not light enough, really. So, you know, even taking it into the context of the, well, in, in American context, with Black Lives Matter and the whole All Lives Matter of Tandy, she matters, she that matters not as a, a dark-skinned black girl. And so I wanted to, um, to zoom in um, the lens on these women in particular because I felt like many of our stories haven't been told by us. Um, I was, um, I mentioned to somebody in the back, um, in the back that we never read Caribbean writers. We never read our own stories in school. We were, right, exactly, yes, yes, exactly. And um, I think Mark in the back, too, I mentioned it to him, where we were given um, stories by British white men to read in high school. And this really angered me. Um, I didn't realize how, ang like how, um, how much I missed out until it was like four years ago when Michelle Cliff passed away. And I was like, who is Michelle Cliff? Um, and then like, having to Google her to find out who she is. Like, why wasn't I taught that in high school, for example? You know, um, Erna Broadway, same thing. Like, fast, very, very talented writer who I look up to. But, you know, she was never given that. Saint, um, I went to St. Andrew High School for Girls in Kingston. And, you know, we weren't, we weren't given those books. And so I felt like that's still our colonial mindset being trickled down. It's generational. Um, and so I felt like, you know, as a writer, especially a writer of color, um, living on the island, or I live here now, but still having that conversation with Jamaicans um, 
um, in, in the country itself and the diaspora that we need to read our own works. We need to really see what really is happening. Um, you know, how we have really internalized so much but not realized that it's subconscious. Um, but that's something that I've uh, tackled in all my works as well. Well, my, 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 my um, fight in this work and in others is with the written word. Not that, we, not that we didn't get it, but that we aren't writing it. And in that I'm saying, I'm speaking here mainly to academics, and I'm saying get into those books that go into the schools and change them. That should be your business in these research institutes. Get the information, get into those books. Um, point out to people that they are wrong and fix it. So it's, I'm speaking to the people who can do it and who should do it. And my quarrel is with them for not doing it. And this is part of what I call complicit in your, um, in your humiliation um, because you are teaching from those books. I remember teaching in Trinidad and in one of the um, books, the children were said, a page said, when you walk down Downing Street, now how many people in Trinidad are walking down Downing Street? Right. But the children didn't pick up the book for themselves. The book was given to them, okay. which should have been changed by the teachers or changed by the publishers or thrown away by somebody long ago. <laughs> yes, so, um, so we are, we the academics are complicit in this because we keep on recycling the stuff instead of cutting out the pages and flinging them away. Thank you. So, you know, it, I had a question that I wasn't sure I wanted to ask because you're not supposed to ask writers, like, who are you writing to? Because then they always say, I write for myself, I'm not, right? I'm not but you both, but, you, but I'm just gonna step right into that trap now because you both have said that you are writing to someone or against someone or for something that is very clearly beyond yourself and the person in the mirror, right? So with that in mind, right, so you're writing works that you mean to be read as widely as possible and to do work in the world. But you both write um, in a style that is at once opaque and an invitation, just by the obvious fact of the amount of the, I'm thinking about the tacky thing of like literary markets and the institution. We were talking about publishing and covers and all of these things, right, the packaging. But at the same time, there is an opacity and an invitation, an invitation to, let's say, the North American, US American reader to do some work in understanding what's going on. So the patois is like the first level. But then there's the fact that, I mean, Maya, um, there's the density, and for you, is the density of the character's psychological reality that you have to do effective labor to appreciate as well, like heart labor, you know, in addition to trying to understand the words on the page and then with you and the structure, right? So what's the, what are you doing? You know, what's the, you're writing for to be heard, to be circulated, to be consumed, right, in that consumer way, but also you're holding a lot back or saying I'm not giving you all of it. All right, fortunately there's a thing called libraries. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's nice to get the royalties, but my business is that there has to be something to be read. And if people won't read it, leave it in the library, they will read it in the year 20, that, 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 that. Because it's in the library. And I also believe in hard work, you know. I don't want to write for the star. I don't want my work to be read through and thrown in the waste paper basket. I want my work to stay there and for people to work hard because my, I myself have been exposed to the study of psychiatry. You work hard and you get into it and it becomes part of you. But if you can read it through like that, then you can throw it away. So I know, if this, my, my friends tell me that the university students who read my stuff say it is very hard and it is head hurting, but they also told, tell me that after the year, so many of them are choosing to write that question, the question on my work in the exam paper, because they now understand it 
And I want them not only to understand it, I want them to understand themselves, because I am writing for therapy. It's therapy I spend my time on. The only book that has not done that is the most recent one, um, Nothing's Matt. Nothing's Matt is therapy for me. For me, Nothing's Matt is the only one that's really written for me. The others, Jane and Louisa was written for my students, my, my, my social work students, who had difficulty finding material when I was teaching them um, human growth and development too. Um, there, was no, there were no case studies that could, be, could help them to further themselves. So I wrote that, it was a case study. It was a case study. Every year at, at March, some student of mine would have to go to the head center because she was having, she or he, was having some psychological problems. And I wanted to write it in such a way that they could understand what was happening to them. And it couldn't be easy because mental illness is not easy. It's not easy to get out of. You have to get into it. And this is what Jane and Louisa was. And then this one was just about the time when they were kicking me out of the University of the West Indies. This was written to my colleagues. Start doing the work, start doing the work. Stop thinking about um, senior lecturer and the rest of it. And stop thinking about having foreign universities see you as, 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 as wise, write for your people, this is what your business should be. That was what Mile is about. And then um, Louisiana was, hey, you black people, all you Americans, all you, the whole of us is the same. We sing the same songs, we went through the same pain. That is what Louisiana was about. And then the, the, the rainmaker's mistake was, listen to me now. We can't just keep on going like this. You have to understand that you have part of the problem and get up and look about yourself. Look into yourself and then we can start moving. So all of those were written to people. As I say, it's only, um, I can't sometimes, nothing's mad. It's only nothing's mad that is, my, that is written to me. And I don't know what else is going to come. Whether I've stopped, whether I've stopped harassing people. <laughs> yes. Before you answer, can I just ask, because I need to understand, what, so why isn't Nothing's Matt for us in some way? Why is it, what oh, makes this, can, it can I be, mean, I know, but. It can be for you as well, but it was intended for me. I had some issues to work out. There was something I needed to understand. And I said, the best way of understanding, actually, it is a concept of fractals, which I could not understand. I do not know why I put myself to understanding, but I just knew that somebody mentioned that Rastafari cannot die because it operates on the principle of fractals. And being Rastafari, it was very important to me to know what he meant. Why didn't I ask him? He wasn't in Jamaica. So I went to the computer, and when I looked in the computer, I saw these, fr these, these, these forms, these, these shapes, these figures. They were pulling me through, they were so magnetic, they were pulling me through the computer. I had to keep on following it. I read everything that could be read. I bothered everybody to tell me about fractals. Then I finally met somebody at a conference in England who said, go and read, um, I forget the name of the person, but fractals in Africa, African fractals. Mm -hmm. And then there I understood why it was bothering me, because it is my thing. It was the way we Africans think. So I wanted to understand it much more. And I said, if I have understood this notion, then I should be able to write a fractal. And that is a fractal. And you will see through it. I went somewhere, somewhere on this continent here, this continent of the United States of America, where, um, <laughs> where somebody said, I, I did a reading there, and there was a physicist there and a mathematician, and they said to me, why is, your work, why is this work so taken up with, with maths? And I said, oh God, thank you very much. Because this is what I was trying to do for myself, understand, make sense, make sense of, of, of mathematics. I don't know if I have completely understood, but there it is, I'm just telling you the honest truth. It was written for me to understand fractals. And um, okay, so I 
who I write for. I write for that young girl in Jamaica who, may, who haven't seen herself on the page until now. So, this, okay, long story short. So I came to writing through Toni Morrison. I found Beloved in the library at school. And you know, this was actually my first encounter with a, a, a black woman a author. Um, you know, I looked at the back of the, the book, and there she was, dreadlocks and everything. I was like, "Wow, who is this?" And of course, that um, led me to read her book. And you know, of course, I was 16. Um, you know, and so of course, I didn't understand the book initially. However, I did treasure that book, and I always think to myself, there is somebody um, craving you know, those, or the stories, you know, somebody craving to see themselves on the page, to hear themselves. And so for me, it's important for me to write the stories that I never saw growing up and also to write the stories of my people. You know, I mentioned earlier that I really write about, um, about working class Jamaican women, um, mostly because I never really saw us on the page. And usually when, when I see working class Jamaican women on the page, it's written by men. Um, and so we end up looking like caricatures. And so I wanted to, um, create complex characters, um, you know, so we could actually, you know, so that when we're actually encountering them on the page, you could see that they're real people. Um, like I said before, you know, Jamaica is sold to this world as a paradise, but you know, you hardly see the people behind the fantasy. You know, who are the Margos, the Tandis, the Dolores? You know, what do they go home to after they say, welcome to Jamaica, I can take you to Don't River Falls. You know, who are these people who actually go back home to nothing at all? Um, and I focus on female protagonists because um, Jamaica is a very female um, dominant space. You know, yes, you know, it's really, um, you know, um, misogynistic, um, very highly sexist for sure. But w when you when you go to come to our island, it's usually females at the front desk, females working the gas stations, females answering the telephone. And you uh, you know, it wasn't until I came to America that I really w had the chance to reflect on this, reflect the fact that well, exactly, we we are actually the 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 um the lay the foundation of that country, but yet still you don't hear our stories. And as a writer, I felt like it was my responsibility to tell our stories, but tell it in an authentic voice. So yes, I am writing um, so that yes, I could be published, you know, mm -hmm. you know um, I feel like it's a lie to just say, yeah, I'm writing for myself, I don't want anybody else to read it. Um, but yeah, I'm writing to be published, but at the same time, I'm writing to be authentic. I want a Jamaican to come to the work and can hear themselves. So my dialect is gonna be in Jamaican, my dialogue is in Jamaican Patois, because two Jamaicans wouldn't, wouldn't be speaking to each other unobserved, speaking standard English. That does, just does not work. Um, and so I didn't want to be that writer where like, the Jamaicans look at my book and read it and fling it across and be like, what is? You know, I want, to, I want them to see themselves and hear themselves. I also want Americans or Europeans, I mean, at, at this point my book um, is, has, um, is not in the global market. Um, and I'd still get messages um, through my publishers or through my agent that people are connecting to the story um, itself. So they're connecting to like a Tandy. You know, yes, there's this black girl bleaching her skin to be, to be lighter skin. But if, um, if you're an individual, if you're a human being, we all have insecurities. It doesn't have to be whether or not you're light or dark. It could be the color of your hair, you know, changing it to blonde in this country, of course. If, you know, that's the standard of beauty. It could be starving yourself to be thin. You know, all these things. So people were connecting to the individuals, um, coming to the page saying, wow, you know, it, it, insecurities are real. And a 15-year-old girl obviously is gonna have that insecure, have insecurities. So can you imagine to add class to that, to add complexionism to that, and what that feels like? Say with Margot and Verdine, Margot is, in love, is secretly in love with a woman, um, Verdine Moore. And you know, at first, to be honest with you, I was terrified because, like I said, I did, I do want Jamaicans to come to my book, um, and so I was like, oh my God! But there, there's a, there's a lesbian theme. But realizing that when I do, when I read that Calabash um, Literary Festival in Jamaica, and when I read in Kingston at Kingston Book Festival, Jamaicans were loving the fact that here's this woman. Um, actually loving the story, the love story, because what they saw was love, right? And again, as human beings, we have experienced love and loss when you reach a certain age, right? And seeing that human experience, that was what they were coming to. And, you know, it could go on and on again um, in terms of displacement. You know, a lot of um, the, the villages in Jamaica, when, you, when the um, resorts expand, they push these people out, working class Jamaicans out, 
right? We don't even hear about those people anymore. Um, and so, yes, this is happening in Jamaica, but it's also happening in bed -Stuy. It's happening in D.C. It's happening in the Philippines. It's happening worldwide, right? So people are saying, wow, you know, displacement is real, and the people who get displaced are usually invisible. Um, so that's what I wanted to um, do. I wanted to actually reimagine these individuals and put them on the page so that people can see them, hear them, and know that they're here, right? They're not gone anywhere. They're here, and they could see them in my, in my works. I'm an African-American woman of Caribbean descent, and so I am fascinated in both of your works, the way you implicate the United States and U.S. blackness in the movement of your characters back and forth from the Caribbean to other spaces, right? It's particularly spaces in the United States. I'm thinking of Maya and Ella's horrible experience with her, her, hus her husband impresario, and obviously about the diasporic spaces you evoke in, um, in a lot of your actual, your not novelistic writing, but the way you talk about being um, an immigrant, of being a Jamaican woman in Brooklyn, in other spaces in the US, et cetera. So I'm wondering, can you, Ellen, obviously Louisiana, and that discovery of the commonality that makes the Americas a black space across the language and et cetera, et cetera. So all to say, can you talk to me a little bit about um, the implication of US blackness and migration and diaspora for you in your formulations of the characters and their struggles and their journeys? Well, to begin with, it is a truth. I hardly know anybody who hasn't been to, the, I mean, any Jamaican who hasn't been to the US. I mean, it's almost as if it is your right. When I hear people complaining that they didn't get a visa, it always seems to me very odd. I mean, as if, you know, you have a right to get a visa and probably feels, people feel it's a right because it's, it's part of the culture. You must go to America. So um, there is no way that America isn't going to influence you. So it is part of the reality. I don't think I could write and not write in the American experience, uh, which I feel um, is more important, which is why that, that that set of essays is being published, is more important today than the British experience. Because the British experience is, is of colonialism. And there are those people who really went to on the wind rush and did this and did that. But America has been, has been for some time a very important part of the Caribbean, certainly of the Jamaican experience. Okay. So in terms of reality, you can't leave it out. You can't leave it out at all. And, um, you know, for me, I, so first of all, I don't think I could, um, you know, I, I value all my experiences. And so I came to the United States at 17 um, to come to college, actually. And it wasn't until coming to college um, that I really learned about my blackness. Because before it was the Jamaicanness, right? But in America, you're black. Uh, whether, you know, whether you're light skinned Jamaican, dark skinned Jamaican, in between, whatever, you're black in America. And so it was, a, a, I wouldn't call it a rude awakening. Um, for me, but it probably, I think it was, kind of. But, you know, being here away from the island, um, it really um, allowed me to look back at my country with a more critical lens and really gave me the courage to dissect everything, to, to dissect my history, my experience. Um, I don't, I feel like if I were in Jamaica, I don't think I would have been the writer I am right today, you know, questioning, often analyzing my culture, um, you know, pointing out what classism looks like, what complexionism looks like, and really, it's really an umbra, under the umbrella of racism, right? Although Jamaicans would deny that we have race, racism on the island, we do have racism on the island. You know, um, you know, for example, our motto is Auto Many One People, but it was designed by the ruling class to silence the voices and to, to really make our 80% black population invisible, right? Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I, I probably brought into all of that back home, but here I do have the courage to say, no, that's BS. Um, but it really was me living in a house of African-American women on, on Cornell University. I lived in Wari House. And I war at Wari, I met these strong African-American women from all over the U.S. And these were beautiful girls with afros and who wore dreadlocks. And at the time I had, you know, my perm hair. I was like, you know, this like a meek little immigrant girl with a very, very, I mean, I have an accent now, but my accent was thicker than this. Um, and so seeing these women, I'm like, and they were so proud and so into like, you know, um, you know, black empowerment and also very um, confident. And so I was like, oh my God, how do I get to that? I want to be that. Um, and it was actually interacting with these girls where I was able to find my own sense of pride. 
you know, as, one, as a dark-skinned black girl, because I was unhappy with being dark-skinned while I was growing up on the island. I used to want to be light. Um, I was a tandy. Um, but I realized very early that it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You're born black, you know, be proud of that. And it was coming to America, interacting with African Americans where that I was able to say, no, I'm proud of my blackness. I shaved my head, right, shaved my perm off, I had a bald head for a while, then my dreadlocks grew and I love it. Um, but really, since, you know, in, in terms of how it, incorporate, it seeped into my writing, you know, um, this book itself, you know, that constant conversation of what, what are you writing against, you know, the Tandys of the world, the Dolores is saying nobody loves a black girl, not even herself, you know, allowing, um, you know, that, that, that questioning, because, you know, like Erna had said, there are things that she writes because she's struggling with certain issues. And so I felt like here comes the sun, there were issues that I was struggling with that I sort out in this book. Um, itself, and so it was really therapeutic for me um, in writing this book. And uh, my second book, Patsy, um, which comes out in June, really tackles more of what it me what it's like being a Jamaican immigrant in the U.S. So, giving more of a U.S. context, and so that that's really the book that will really tackle um, everything I just went um, explained just now, plus more um, in terms of you know race dynamics, class dynamics, gender, and sexuality. Uh, my, my American thing too is political, it's political. I'm saying it for the first time openly, but to tell you the honest truth, I'm more black than Caribbean. And being black, it means that I have to be involved with the United States of America. There's no way without it. So I, the, the, the phrase I use is the descendants of Africans enslaved in the new world. That is a term I use very often, which involves Brazil, it involves, and it has to be, uh, the way I see it, if we are to rise up and do something, it's not the Caribbean, which is a very mixed up, mixed up place. It has to be, you have to understand yourself to be a descendant of Africans enslaved in the new world. That is what you have to be. And it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, you have, first of all, to understand that if you are going to do something political. So it's political for me, okay. And can I just add one more thing yeah. too? I have this conversation, because um, my wife is um, black American, right? And we always have this conversation where as immigrants, you know, you come to the United States and you know, because of our mentality, we're, like we're not black yet, until, you know, put us in a situation where we know who we are, right? Pull, get pulled over by a police officer, whatever, right? But um, one thing I realized too is, you know, how could we come to a country like the US? Um, just to piggyback on what Ernie was saying, and, um, you know, look at African Americans as different than, than us as Jamaicans, especially as black Jamaicans. Because, you know, um, I said this um, just earlier, you know, we, are, we were dismissed by our own country um, based on our skin color, sometimes based on our class. For me, also sexuality. Um, and then to come to America and to, you know, look at African Americans who have also been dismissed by their own country. So really we do have a lot of things, a lot more in common, you know, more than skin color as well. Experience. Yeah. I just want to, 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 to underline something which a black American young man told me in the 1960s when I was over in this country. He said, sister, they don't ask you to talk before they shoot. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think I will let, I have questions, so if you're not fast enough, I will ask my other questions, but I will let you have your chance first, so. I write nonfiction probably more than I write fiction. I started off life with two books. One of them was The Abandonment of Children in Jamaica, and the other one was Yards in the City of Kingston. Uh, those are nonfiction. And the thing that is coming out anytime now is nonfiction. And what I'm working on now is also nonfiction. I go where I feel there is a need. And sometimes there is a need for the nonfiction. Sometimes you have to do it in fiction. I am what a friend of mine calls an intellectual worker. I am a worker. You have some plumbers, you have some carpenters. Mine is intellectual because that's what I'm trained to do, to use my intellect. And I must use it in any way that is going to benefit my people. So if it's nonfiction, if it's a play, because I've done that too, I will do that. If it's drama, I will do that. I can't sing, but if I have to sing, I will sing. 
So it's not just fiction, it's not just fiction for me. It's, it's, it's just, it's writing ourselves for ourselves, understanding ourselves, and the gift I have is a writing. Okay. I write, I write um, essays. Um, I haven't wrote, written a, a non-fiction book, but I do have essays. My question is about probably the title of the talk, uh, Critical Caribbean Feminisms. Um, I'm wondering about the, um, the relationship between your work and other, uh, more, um, other Caribbean uh, women authors and philosophers, such as Sylvia Winter or uh, Maryse Condé. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is uh, basically um, how you situate yourself within this title. Do you think of your work as part of this kind of legacy of Caribbean feminism? And um, how do you yourself situate yourself? Um, I, okay, so um, that's another thing that I, I think about as well when I write. You know, um, how, you know, what I just said a while ago about write, the importance of writing Jamaican women, Jamaican working class women. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, our stories or oftentimes we ourselves are marginalized. You know, the country as a whole focuses on um, other stuff like homophobia um, in, in the country, right? But rarely do you see the stories of working class Jamaican women. And so for me, it's important to put women on the page. Um, even when I said before that, you know, we, are run, the country is run by women, right? We're the foundation, but yet still, you know, when it comes to like anything in, in the intellectual space or in literature, we're not there. And for me to write, to write Jamaica, you know, writing women means I'm writing Jamaica, I'm writing home. Um, and I think by our stories being told, for me, that's my, that's my feminism, um, to tell our story as um, complex, um, to be as unapologetic as possible, right? Meaning not to hide anything. You know, um, we were taught as girls to respect shame and silence more than our own voice. And so for me, giving voice and um, voicing, you know, stuff that I went through and also like, you know, you know, I remember as a child just listening to the older women um, in the living room or in the kitchen talking and, you know, you know, them thinking I'm, I'm inquisitive, but really just, li just listening to them and knowing that they, there's talks among themselves, but rare, very rarely, um, you know, it's, it's told elsewhere, right? And very rarely it's, we as children were exposed to that. And so I wanted to, um, to actually bring that back to bring that com those conversations back because really when writing about tough issues like for example the sexualization of our young girls in Jamaica right right now as we speak abortion is illegal in our country in Jamaica but yet still um, what's legal um, or actually the, the, the people who um, you know the, the persons who molest or rape these girls sometimes they don't even go to, they don't have prison time you know, they walk around, they're the, um, the people on the block, they're the well-beloved persons in the community, but yet still what the country's willing to talk about more than anything else is, oh, the gay person over there, right? How he or she shouldn't even exist on the island. Yet still they accept pedophiles and rapists. And what, what's that? What is that saying about the country? So really putting that in the book, and like I said, being less didactic, but sneaking it in there so that it's really holding up a mirror to our society. Um, Sylvia Winter and Maris Conde and stuff like that, and um, I would like to I would like to respond to that. I'm working very hard to respond to that. All, what I really have to say is that Maurice Conde has her thing to do, and Sylvia Winter had her thing to do, and I have mine to do. So I really don't. I read them and I enjoy them, but they aren't saying what I want to say. I have to say my thing. Okay. This is for Dr. Broadbur. I am very intrigued by the fact that you have brought Obia or Mayal to the public. And even though in the South you have Dr. Buzzard, and there are lots of similar stories to, in Jamaica, in academia there isn't a lot of discussion around Mayal, what I knew as Obia. So I'm wondering how, how, how the maybe how academia and other people here in, especially the North, have reacted to understanding Mayal? Um, that is sort of difficult for me because I'm not one of the persons who reads reviews. But if it got a prize for um, 
Commonwealth literature, then I believe that some people have taken it seriously. Okay, okay. But let me get, go further. By the way, this lady and I started off high school in the same year, in the same class, for about five or six years. So um, we, 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 we have know each other's head. Yes, so um, I have moved. One of the things I learned while I was doing the research for Maya, and I did the research by interviewing four healers, because it was not just the obia, it was a healing, and how can we heal each other? And this is where I looked for the healing, for the notions of healing. And these people taught me this and taught me that. And I mean, I have known obia growing up in country, because I've known about obia. But one of the things I have done now, that I have respect for what my people do in healing, which some people have to call, call obia, and some people call maya, or some people call anything they feel like. It's something that we need to know. We need to know and we need to respect the way our people have managed their lives. And they have managed them. Nobody can beat them down on that. They have managed them. So I have moved from this now. I have something called black space, which is a set of reasonings which happens every year. And one of the things I have managed to do is have people discuss, it's not called obia, discuss African retentions. And we have, we have people, I have been greatly informed by people who have come in, the people, there's quite a few people that I know who are young, young people who are stepping up into Yoruba. And there are a number of people who I know who are into the, um, are, are, are into Dagara, and so on. And we're exposing them. We're exposing them. Exposing them to Jamaica. Things that Jamaica know but don't want to know. These people have learned them, they have studied them, and they can tell us what we, help us to understand what we know but don't want to know. Okay. So, so I've moved from, I've moved from the book into the, another stage of communication another stage of teaching, okay, of having people come in and talk about that. This is a space where you can come in and talk about obia as well. And you can learn that ob what obia is, so you have learned what, um, what dangers occur from not having respected it so that it goes underground and can be of harm instead of something else which could be. All right. Yeah, hello, my uh, question is for um, Nicole. I read your book, I thought it was brilliant, brilliant in the sense of the breadth of the book, the width, looking at moving from uh, like uh, the whole idea of the tourist economy, sexual assault, um, uh, intervention of investors coming in, expanding, whether it's good for the country, good for the people and all of that. And um, I also like how you develop the characters and I find that you were very balanced, even though you were con dealing with these very political issues, you were not really, coming across as though you were trying to take a one position. I have one question though, because I'm actually in the field of queer studies, and so I read with a deeper eye when it comes to queer issues. And I really like, I think your, your, your work is revolutionary in, in, in terms of its status as to how it contributes to the body of Caribbean queer literature. And certainly I've never read a word that's talking about uh, uh, um, LGBT community in Jamaica that centers uh, lesbian lives and lesbian eroticness. The question I have, though, is that I do notice, because I went through the, the text, and I kind of counted the scenes, the erotic scenes between the woman, and also the heteronormative scenes. And I find that even though you went ahead and narrated the erotic scenes between the lesbian woman, which is something that's not done in, uh, certainly in uh, J Jamaican literature, I, f I still realize that, I don't know if you realize it, but there were more straight scenes, erotic straight scenes, than there, there were lesbian scenes. And I was wondering if that was deliberate. And, I was, and so my question is, did you have any contention with yourself as to what extent you will narrate erotic scenes when contending with the Jamaican audience you're writing for and also the global audience? Yeah. yeah. Oh, ooh, good question. You know, um, to be honest with you, I never even thought about it um, in terms of how many erotic scenes between Verdine and Margot um, versus Margot and the numerous tourists um, that she slept with. 
Um, for me, honestly, you know, it was actually in retrospect, I uh, wrote an essay in Powell, for Powell's books, and one of the things that I realized as I was writing that essay and thinking back, reflecting back on writing Here Comes the Sun, especially Margot's character, was that I feared Margot. Um, you know, I didn't fear her because she was a prostitute. Um, I feared her because of her love for Verdine. You know, of course, Margot would, Margot would never say love or that she's a lesbian, um, but that attraction, that's, that's what I feared. And, I, there was a reason for that. It wasn't because I was writing, um, hoping that, oh, you know, Jamaicans, I'm thinking, oh, Jamaicans are gonna read this and like, oh my gosh. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't that. What it was, was the poison of my MFA program. Um, let me explain. So, in, when you actually do an MFA, right, there's gonna be a conversation about what's literary and what's, um, what's just, you know, um, com commercial, right? And usually, unfortunately, lesbian um, books or LGBT books, LGBTQIA books, are usually shelved in that ghetto. They're actually ghettofied. Oh yeah, that's that's the back shelf over there that you have to pass the you know the magazines and go all the way back, right? That's the kind of books that you know w w w historically, and also black anything having black content as well. Unfortunately. Um, and you know, I'm glad that I did not, I wasn't thinking about that while I was writing, but somehow my subconscious retained that. And while I was ri writing Verdine and uh, Margot scene, I was really afraid of the sex scenes, afraid that it would, be ta it would actually take away from the story itself. You know, feeling that people might focus on that, but not on the breadth. You, you mentioned the breadth of the, the, the story, you know, classism, complexionism, you know, um, working class Jamaicans on this island trying to survive, right? That's really the, the bulk of the book. And I was really fearful that the lesbian scenes would take, take away from it. Um, Luckily enough, I was able to salvage a lot more than you know than the the, the other Nicole would have, the um, cautious Nicole would have, because it wasn't until I let go and have Margot um, lead me into the story that the story really opened up. Um, what I regret, yes, I do regret her not having another sex scene or two with Verdine. Um, but moving forward, yes, there you know, I know what to do now. But thanks for that. <laughs> Hi, this is for Nicole Dennis, Dennis Ben. Um, going off that last question, how do you situate sex work or underground sexual economies, in this case survival sex, survival sex work, within, particularly within queer community, queer life? How do you situate that within colonialism in a broader sense? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I, so, um, like I said, Margot is doing this for survival. Um, you know, what I was really trying to capture with that character is that she's really doing everything that she knew, right? Margot was taught, um, she was sold into um, prostitution at a very young age. So she's using what she knows. And um, like I said earlier too, um, Education is not free in Jamaica, right? We, we took an exam called the Common Entrance Exam at the age of 10 or 11. And if you pass that exam, good for you. Go into, go into a good high school and you get funneled into college, hopefully University of the West Indies or college abroad, right? If you fail that exam, you get funneled into the secondary schools or the less the, um, the schools that are not deemed oh prominent, right? Not the Immaculates or the Wilmers or the Campions. If, if you're Jamaicans in here, you know what those schools represent, right? Um, so from your 10 or 11 years old, your fate is determined, right, for you. And so unlike Tandy, the younger sister in the book, Margot didn't have such opportunities, right? She um, didn't, you know, she wasn't um, able to get through school, and obviously her mother couldn't afford school. So what she does, she uses her body. And um, really what I was doing with that too is, you know, it's also showing the exploitation of women, females' body with exploitation of our country itself. Because Jamaica herself is a prostitute, sold by our government, right? Exploited by our own government for tourism. Um, but I wanted to actually make that known that women in our society, when they have to survive, they, they do anything by any means necessary. And for Margot, it was really sending her sister Tandy to school so that Tandy does not end up in the same fate. Now, it's obviously a job to Margot because her her preference is women, um, is Verdine more. But she knows she has to do what she has to do to send her sister to school, to put food on the table. Um, and so really, that's really her um, saying, you know, in, in a country where upward mobility is hard, that's what she's faced with. And feeling that she deserves a piece of the pie too. Not just wealthy ruling class Jamaicans that already think our country is a paradise, but the Margos of our society, they deserve a piece of that pie. 
And they're going to do what they need to do, whatever they need to do. And so that was really her, that's, that was how I was processing that character. All right, we need to take our last question, but there will be time for extended conversation during book signing, and we have a small reception. So one final question. So um, this question is for Nicole. Um, and I'm taking a Caribbean class right now, and I just finished reading your book. And I just wanted to ask, were there any struggles when writing this book about a female who was struggling with not only her color, but discovering her sexuality? Any struggles? Um, I, there were lots of struggles. You know, um, like I said, I was kind of working on certain issues. So um, Here Comes the Sun, I didn't write the outline for this book until I went back home to Jamaica in 2010 after a self-imposed exile. Um, I really left the country hurting. I really left the country because I felt like I was being dismissed. I was, it, the country wasn't claiming me when I was claiming the country, um, if that makes sense. You know, so growing up dark-skinned working class was one thing. You know, seeing how the um, uptown lighter skinned children were treated as opposed to how I was treated in primary school. Um, coming out to myself as a lesbian. All these different things were like strikes against me as an individual. And I felt like by the time I left home for college here, I didn't want to come back. Um, it wasn't until when I met my wife who was like, well, you know, you're Jamaican, you, have, you obviously have an accent, but I never met your people, I, never, I don't know your country. And I said, you know what? Let me take her back to Jamaica to show her the country. And that's what I did in 2010. And when I went there, all these feelings came back. All, everything that I thought I stored and was, you know, I, you know, swept under the carpet just came flooding. So that was really how the Tandy scene got written. You know, feel, remembering when I was that young girl in a very elite school where most of the upper class girls were light skinned and did not invite you to the lunch table because you look different from them or because you also have a different address. I grew up in Vineyard Town, Kingston, right by Excelsior High School. Um, and, you know, they lived in Barbican and Jacksville. Those are very elite places in the, in the country. And if your parents wasn't driving that Lexus and if you weren't living on that hill and your hair wasn't down to your waist and you, hadn't, you didn't have the cream complexion, that's it for you in that school. So that was where Tandy came from. And the Margos came from that um, observation that I was staying in a hotel with my wife because I wasn't invited home um, in my parents' home because uh, we, you know, we were together. And being that they're Christian, they were like, nope, we're not gonna have you guys stay with us. Get a hotel. And it wasn't until when I um, signed in at the hotel and saw these Jamaicans parading around, right, the fantasy. They didn't know I was Jamaican. Um, I guess when you're away for some time, Jamaicans tend to, see, like, tend to think that you're foreign. So they didn't know I was Jamaican. Um, they, most of them were listening to my wife's accent and like, oh, American, so let me, let me act. And in that um, acting, um, I, I realized, wow, they're performing for us, but I know these people. I know who they are, I know what they're going home to as opposed to what they're selling. And so that was where the idea of Margot clicked, where I was like, no, let me write about these people. Let me write about the Dolores who sell souvenirs at the, um, the markets, you know, um, just to make a living um, and, you know, humanize these individuals. Um, and so that was the idea of writing those struggles for people to see them on the page. Because usually, you know, people just dismiss them as, you know, they go on vacation and forget these people usually. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank our invited guests and our moderator, and thank you all for coming tonight.